Thank you very much, Lisa, and thank you all for coming. I know it's, uh, it's a, busy, a busy time for us. So you're here uh, to, to visit Notre Dame. We're, we welcome you. You're all alumni and friends of the, of the university. And, uh, and what I'd like to talk to you all about today is the work of uh, the Center for Ethics and Culture and what we do and what our vision is and what, uh, what, where we fit within the university and what our mission is vis-a-vis -vis the students, faculty, friends, and so on of the university, but also what our relationship is in the public square, both nationally and internationally, uh, as representatives of Notre Dame and, and the work that we do. So what I'd like to do is just to give you an overview, again, of our mission and, and describe to you uh, some of our projects that illustrate what it is, uh, what it is that we're trying to, to achieve here, both on campus and off campus. Uh, I think a concise way to sort of say what it is that we're about is that we, is this aspect of our mission statement. Namely, everything that we do at the Center for Ethics and Culture is aimed at one goal, and that is to share the richness of the Catholic moral and intellectual tradition through teaching, research, and dialogue uh, at the highest level and across a range of disciplines. So we're a, we're a platform, we're a university center that is engaged in the business of teaching. We have all sorts of programming for students, faculty, staff, friends, and other, our colleagues at other academic institutions. We conduct our own research. We have fellows that, do, uh, that, that write monographs. We have edited volumes. We have white papers and the like. And we have dialogue. And dialogue is a crucially important element uh, of, of our agenda here at the Center for Ethics and Culture. We, of course, want to be in dialogue with our colleagues here across the university in different disciplines. But we also want to be in dialogue with folks outside the university as well as folks in the public square, again with the aim of showing exactly the richness and complexity of the Catholic moral and intellectual tradition, especially as it relates to vexing questions both in ethics and in public policy, but also sorts of cultural questions that the Catholic tradition offers unique, uniquely compelling, in my judgment, answers to. And the dialogue isn't merely with those around campus, around the world, that, that share our view of the Catholic uh, tradition. We also are in dialogue with people who have different points of view. And we want to uh, have fruitful exchange with those folks and hopefully uh, exert a positive influence on their way of thinking as well. So one way to understand in a kind of concrete sense how this plays out, both here at Notre Dame and, and off, off campus as well, is to take a look at what we have uh, already undertaken this year uh, as well as what we have planned for the balance of the year. And then I'll follow that with a discussion of some of the new projects, some new initiatives that we've that are now in the preliminary standing, uh, pl stages. And you'll get a sense from, from the description of each of these individual uh, initiatives exactly how we regard ourselves as, a, as, a, as an important mechanism to transmit the, the value and all of the content that we have, as the Catholic tradition does, to those folks across a variety of disciplines and a variety of enterprises. Um, uh, and and it's, it's exciting, both for the students and for us, to be involved in such a wide array of activities, not just ethics, public policy, philosophy, and the like. I'm a lawyer, I'm a, law, a legal scholar, but also involving literature, arts, uh, uh, music, uh, and so on. I mean, the, the, the Catholic tradition, as you all know, the great gifts of the Catholic tradition expand every aspect of, of human endeavor and every element of human life and brings a richness uh, and, and a kind of compelling vision in all of these contexts. And we find that our students, some students come to Notre Dame with a great sense already of what the Catholic tradition offers. Some, like myself, when I, I was from Birmingham, I'm from Birmingham, Alabama, and a uh, uh, very small Catholic community there. I was, I was baptized Catholic, grew up Catholic, but, uh, but the only, the only, there are not many Catholics where, where I'm from. It was me and like two Lebanese kids, and that was about it. Uh, and they were Maronite Catholics. So, um, so when, I, uh, when I, I was fortunate enough to go to a college, uh, which, which even though it was a secular college, uh, was driven by the Great Books Program, Great Books of Western Civilization, which of course are heavily informed by, Catholic, uh, by the Catholic contribution to human civilization. And, uh, and we try to do at the center the same things that I was able to benefit from, but in an even richer way here at the University of Notre Dame, to help these kids understand the heritage that they, they're a part of, or those who aren't Catholic to understand uh, what exactly we have on offer. So to start, we, we uh, this fall, we've, we, as we have in years past, uh, had a Catholic literature series. And we take an author who is uh, him or herself Catholic, whose work is prominent and informed by his or her Catholicism. And this year we took up the work of J.R.R. Tolkien, obviously the author of the very famous uh, Lord of the Rings trilogy and The Hobbit. And we thought this would be a great opportunity this year to explore the richness of, of Tolkien's work because The Hobbit is coming out. They're actually coming out with a major motion picture that's going to be divided into three parts. 
undergraduate students were really excited about it. And we had four lectures from very interesting scholars, both here for, at Notre Dame, but also from outside of Notre Dame, talking about the different dimensions uh, to, uh, in which Tolkien's work uh, was influenced and reflects uh, the, the Catholic tradition and his own, his own Catholicism. And as you can see from these photos, we filled the Bartolo Hall. Students were extraordinarily excited uh, about the project and, uh, and I think uh, benefited from it enormously. And we benefited uh, from this process as well uh, to be able to share this with these students. The second uh, element uh, that we've actually already had this semester was a panel discussion on the upcoming election and the economic landscape. And uh, the event was held October 3rd, and it featured four uh, of the nation's most, really the world's most prominent macroeconomists who uh, are, we're fortunate enough to have here at Notre Dame. Uh, folks who have been here for a while, folks like uh, Nelson Mark, who does international macroeconomics, relatively new hires, such as Michael Pries, who is a, a labor uh, macroeconomist who came a few years ago, Eric Sims, a relatively recent hire, an assistant professor from the University of Michigan, who was the most sought after graduate student uh, in the country, uh, who came to Notre Dame because of its Catholic character and because it offers something distinctive and rich that he didn't feel that he could get anywhere else. He was an undergraduate here at Notre Dame, got his doctorate at Michigan. We can forgive him the choice of Michigan. Uh, he, came back, he came back to Notre Dame. And this gentleman, Tim Fierst, here, is, uh, is one of the most widely published macroeconomists uh, in the world. Joined our faculty recently as a chair in our economics department uh, because, again, because of the Catholic identity and distinctive nature of, of our Catholic heritage at the university. He felt that as a leading thinker in economics, he would have a, 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 an opportunity to pursue his discipline in the most um, intellectually exciting and alive atmosphere a spiritually nourishing atmosphere here at the University of Notre Dame. And what this illustrates, I hope, is something that the center, my center, tries to do, which is to say reaches across the university into other disciplines, here economics. In the previous slide, uh, you saw uh, individuals from the political science department, Mary Keyes, David O'Connor from philosophy, Dan David Fagerberg from, from theology. What we try to do is we try to reach out to individuals across the university, people who are at the top of their fields, and bring them together and expose them to our students and to one another and to folks on, and outside the academy to try to, uh, you know, as a, as, a, as a mechanism, again, for sharing uh, the distinctiveness of, of what Notre Dame offers vis-a-vis -vis its Catholic character. And this was, this was an example. So we have four macroeconomists top of their field, talking about the economic landscape, how to understand and filter all the arguments that you hear about when you're listening to all the political ads and all the, the debates and the like, to how to understand exactly uh, from a sort of technical point of view what the challenges are, what solutions might look like, but not just from a technical perspective, also from the perspective in light of human dignity and the common good as, as understood by uh, and elaborated by uh, our, our Catholic tradition. So it was a great panel. And I think a good representation of the kind of collaborative activity that we try to do at the center uh, to take the great resources we have here on campus at Notre Dame and bring them together in a way that is interesting and exciting uh, for our students and for our community of learning here. Now, we're not just about academic and intellectual enrichment, although that's crucial to what we do. We're also about building community. And one of the things that we do here at the Center for Ethics and Culture is to have a series of tailgates uh, for uh, not just our, our faculty and students, but also for friends of the, uh, of the university as well, who come and uh, enjoy fellowship and, 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 and sort of kind of a human-shaped uh, form of exchange that we can have, to, which even further deepens our, our special community of learning that we're here trying to develop. And as you can see, that's my son Carlo on my back there. It's a very family-friendly uh, atmosphere. It's, uh, it's, uh, it's, it's part of what we do, I mean, again, the Catholic tradition is open to every aspect of human life, uh, humanly lived, and that includes fellowship together and, 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 and not simply focusing uh, on, on, on a single-minded way on intellectual pursuits. We also have a series called the Bread of Life series, which is meant, again, to integrate our faculty from across the university with our students. And this, and this particular issue, we care very much about the life issue at the Center for Ethics and Culture. We promote the dignity of human life from conception to natural death. And we have, uh, we have a lecture series wherein we bring prominent faculty members. Here, Patrick Deneen, recent hire from Georgetown University, very prominent uh, political theorist, 
who in fact came to Notre Dame and was very was, made a lot of, of waves in, in, in higher academia because he published an open letter upon leaving Georgetown, and I say this as a graduate of Georgetown, to come to Notre Dame because, again, of its distinctive Catholicity that permeates every aspect uh, of what we do. Uh, and Patrick Deneen, a close friend of the center, uh, uh, gave a lecture to students just a few nights ago about life issues in the public square, uh, building a, a robust culture of life. And as you can see, uh, the event itself doesn't merely involve a lecture delivered in an auditorium, but it also it's a, it involves a kind of communal meal. There's a brief, that's our Dean of the College of Engineering, Peter Kilpatrick, another great friend of the Center for Ethics and Culture, give a brief lecture on, on an issue that relates to the dignity of human life. And then each table will involve students and a, and a faculty member to, to have a kind of uh, informal uh, opportunity to have discussion and fellowship about these issues. So the students not only learn about the theoretical and, and applied aspects of, of the disciplines and discussion underway by the speaker, but they also feel nourished by the, by the community and they see them, you know, they, if, if you're a pro-life kid and you come to Notre Dame and you wonder, you know, am I, you know where, where are the other people here? Do I have support? Do I feel like I'm part of a real pro-life community? This is an event that facilitates those kinds of exchanges. Not only do they meet other kids who are committed to the value of human life at every stage of development, but also they get to meet faculty, which I have to say is a very unusual thing in higher academia. At an elite research university, to have faculty who are committed to this issue is something that leads these kids uh, to, you know, encourages them, makes them feel energized, energizes the faculty to see these young folks um, in this setting and we think it's a very positive, uh, positive uh, opportunity for everyone involved. Now, the flagship event, academically, intellectually, for, for, the, uh, for the Center for Ethics and Culture, since its inception in 2001, is the annual fall conference. And the fall conference, and this I think, the fall conference, this, this year, this is actually next week, next Thursday to Saturday, November 8th through 10th, 2012, it provides an opportunity for, and we, and we have, we usually draw a crowd of about 500 or 600 people, to come, to come to this event. These are students, faculty and staff, members of the Notre Dame community, alumni and friends, folks from not just from the United States, but from all over the world, come to listen to panel discussions, particip to participate in dialogue and exchange about a very broad topic. It doesn't get much broader than justice. Justice is the topic this year. This is, of course, a quote from Cicero, the crowning glory of the virtues. Uh, exploring the many facets of justice. This is actually a beautiful fresco called Buen Governo, which is from a, uh, from a, a building in Siena, which is a kind of uh, Catholic artistic representation uh, of justice and wisdom and, and, and other virtues. And again, captures the sort of classical feel and the, the multi-level um, approach that we take, interdisciplinary approach. Basically, we have, we'll have a whole list of luminaries, both from here on campus as well as off campus from around the world, Academics, of course, also public figures uh, coming to discuss these issues. Again, ranging on topics from public policy, law, um, political theory, but also panel on Dostoevsky and literature, justice and literature, mercy and punishment, theology. Uh, it's a very, very broad array of, of, um, of, of questions, angles of approach, something for everybody. And again, it shouldn't be surprising for those of us familiar with the Catholic moral and intellectual tradition because it does, in fact, it's so capacious that it encompasses many, many disciplines and many, many perspectives. But just a few of the faces that you'll be seeing this year at the fall conference include Robbie George from Princeton University, who's the, arguably the most prominent Catholic intellectual in the United States, American Catholic intellectual in the United States. He will be debating Michael Sandel from Harvard University, who is a very prominent, probably the most prominent secular uh, theorist of justice. He teaches the most subscribed course at Harvard University on justice. They will be debating uh, justice and free market economics. Talk about questions uh, of, of value and, 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 and uh, how, how uh, justice plays out or doesn't play out, as the case may be, in the, in the, uh, in, within the theorizing and the application of, of free market economics. Uh, Lorenzo Violini, who is one of the most prominent uh, legal scholars in the world at the University of Milan, a constitutional law scholar, will be talking about justice, science, and governance. We have John Tomasi from Brown University, who will be talking about uh, free, market, uh, free market economics and limited government and the problem of poverty. He wrote an interesting and provocative book arguing that libertarian political theory and, and, and economic policy and 
limited government is a, a fruitful way to address the problem of poverty. He'll, he'll give that talk and it, there'll be a response offered from uh, Professor Jim Sullivan from our economics department who works on poverty, who I gather doesn't share the same premises as Professor Tomasi, so it'll be a robust exchange from folks uh, thinking creatively about, about political theory and the problem of poverty. We'll also have someone who needs no introduction, Alistair McIntyre, one of the most important Catholic intellectuals of the 20th century. Uh, we'll be speaking about, about Catholicism and, and justice. We have Eva Brand, who's the former dean of St. John's College in Annapolis, Maryland, talking about Plato's statesman. My colleague, Peg Brennig, who's a family law scholar in the law school, widely published family law scholar, will be talking about uh, family law, the family, and children, justice for the least among us. And our keynote speaker will be a gentleman named Mark Phillip, who is a federal judge in the Northern District, Northern District of Illinois, the Deputy Attorney General of the United States, and Acting Attorney General of the United States, both in the Bush and the Obama administration. He finished up uh, his time in the Bush administration and then was asked by President Obama to stay on until his own nominee, Eric Holder, was confirmed. So Mark Phillip uh, is, a, is a person who enjoys enormous respect from both sides of the political spectrum and is an extraordinary thinker and we'll be talking about justice and the rule of law on Thursday night, our, our keynote speaker. Every year we have two lectures, the Schmidt Lecture, these are for fellows in engineering and science who uh, are themselves scientists and engineers, but we try to bring them uh, uh, programming that, that explains the, the humanistic dimensions of the disciplines they have uh, under study. This year we'll be hearing from Carl Schneider. Uh, law professor uh, and professor of internal medicine at the University of Michigan talking about the current framework for regulating research involving human subjects and he'll offer a provocative critique uh, of, of how we regulate research involving human subjects both in universities and in the private sector as well. As I've said, we have, uh, we're committed to the respect for life uh, at the Center for Ethics and Culture and in connection with that we sponsor a wide array of faculty and students to attend the March for Life every January to commemorate the, uh, the anniversary of, of, of Roe versus Wade. Here you can see a number of faculty from the university and also a number of students. I think there's my associate director, Angela Pfister, with political science professor Mary Keyes. Uh, we bring normally about 300 undergraduate students and law students and, and, other, and graduate students to the March each year. This year we're going to try to bring 500 students out and, and over 100 faculty. Um, every spring we have a medical ethics conference. Uh, it's, uh, and this year, we'll be hearing from an extraordinary woman, Dr. Elvira Paravicini, who's at Columbia University Hospital in New York. She's an Italian woman who's developed a special protocol for palliative care, that is, for comfort care for, for newborns who are, who are uh, imminently dying. And it's an extraordinary uh, vocation, extraordinary ministry that she's adopted uh, to try to give parents and siblings and the newborns themselves a human experience uh, uh, of contact and comfort uh, in, in, the, uh, in those moments where the children's lives are in, 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 in serious danger, very seriously ill infants and infants who, who, are, who are terminally ill. She's an amazing woman and she'll be giving an, an account not just of the, the technical details of her protocol but the sort of human anthropology, the human moral anthropology that motivated her to get into this area to begin with. I mean she begins with the, pro once, the children, uh, once the children are diagnosed in utero is having deadly diseases in many cases. She counsels the parents and constructs an entire framework of comfort care, palliative care, that allows the parents, the children, the newborns themselves to have a, 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 an important uh, opportunity to bond and be with one another. And she's, she's a, a, an amazing person and we look forward to hearing her as our keynote speaker at the Medical Ethics Conference. Now this is a little bit outside the box, but I would like to point out that, uh, that there's a gentleman named John Waters from Ireland. He's a, he's a uh, in fact, <laughs> uh, John Waters is, uh, is a journalist. He writes for the Irish Times. He's sort of a cultural commentator. He's by training a sort of a, a, a music journalist. And uh, as you can see from his appearance, he looks like he would fit right in with uh, any rock and roll setting. Uh, he himself uh, had a, a reversion to Catholicism uh, as an adult and wrote a beautiful little book called Lapsed Agnostic. And, uh, and he is a, a, a very famous sort of cultural figure and uh, has an extraordinary multimedia presentation that he gives tracing the history, the arc of the history of rock and roll music from its inception in the American uh, Delta Blues all the way to present day uh, and explains how even in many instances 
in most instances, unbeknown to the artists themselves, running through the entirety uh, of, of rock and roll as a, as a historical uh, phenomenon is a kind of deep existential yearning for God and the infinite, an almost Augustinian restlessness. Uh, and in typical uh, Irish fashion, he is a, he's an eloquent and, and compelling speaker. And, and again, this is one way in which we can reach our students and uh, you know, where they live and explain to them how you, know, you might think you know, culturally rock and roll is a corrosive force. Uh, Water says to the contrary, if you know what to look for and if you study it carefully, in fact, even contrary to the intentions of the artists themselves, you find something that is very humanly rich and ultimately points to God and the divine. And he has a very special kind of Catholic overlay that he brings to this analysis. We're bringing him out for a, a week this April to give this lecture and to meet with our students uh, and, uh, and to hopefully uh, influence them in a positive way. Finally, by way of things that we've been doing, every summer we have an institute called the Vita Institute, where it's a two-week boot camp, which we undertake uh, in conjunction with the Notre Dame Fund to Protect Human Life, uh, whereby we train the next generation of pro-life leaders. And it's an interdisciplinary boot camp where we train them in the philosophy, the science, the law, the public policy, the communication skills that are necessary to advocate for life uh, in all of its forms, from conception to natural death. We have, we have students, uh, we have, we have, well, we have graduate students, we have teachers from Catholic high school. We also have people who are involved in, uh, in, in the world of public policy in Washington, DC. Uh, Jenny Monahan, one of our recent alums, was just named to take over for the recently deceased Nellie Gray, who runs the 200,000 plus person March for Life every spring she works uh, at a think tank in Washington, DC. And this is one way in which we can influence uh, the, both uh, here at Notre Dame and outside of Notre Dame, the next generation of pro-life leaders. Now, what about the new initiatives? As I've said, our animating principle here, our purpose is to promote the flourishing of the Catholic character here on campus by sharing the richness of the Catholic moral and intellectual tradition, but also to project Notre Dame's voice out into the public square and put a footprint in the public square for Notre Dame in which we representing the university, speak out in the name of human dignity and the common good. And in many instances, I think there are ways to achieve simultaneously those two goals. That is, to promote the learning and formation of our students while also exerting a positive influence in the public square. One way we're going to do that is through the pursuit and development of undergraduate internships. We're going to send our students out in the summertime to the U.S. Conference of Catholic Bishops, Catholic Charities, Catholic Relief Services run by Notre Dame uh, business dean Carolyn Wu, an extraordinary friend of the center, an amazing person in her own right, the National Right to Life, and also into the halls of Congress, working for con on the staffs of congressmen and senators. And in this way, our students will get an experiential opportunity to learn by doing, but also our students will be able to exert a positive influence on the direction of these institutions. So it's a, it's a double effect, if you will. Our students benefit, but on top of that, we actually get to project the, the influence of the Center for Ethics and Culture in Notre Dame into the public square in a positive way. In, here, internal to the university, we have a very exciting opportunity. My colleague, John Finnis, the most important philosopher of natural law living today, uh, who is our permanent uh, distinguished fellow of the center, has agreed to house his papers with us at the university, along with theologian Germain Grizet, and we're going to combine with the Maritain Center, who already have the original papers of other towering figures, Catholic thinkers from the 20th century, and create a library whereby not only our students benefit, but people can come from outside the university to study the work of these thinkers directly. Similarly, insofar as we're reaching out into academia, elite academia, our peer institutions, our aspirational peer institutions, we want to, we're, gonna, we're going to, um, to re-energize our book series. That is, we're going to increase our publications, our scholarly production. So that not only are we speaking to students, faculty, and staff, and in the public square, but we're also speaking to our colleagues at other universities in the form of these academic texts themselves. I've already mentioned the public square a couple times now, but it, I, I, I came from the world of public policy. I came from the world of law and, and advocacy. And it's really important to me that Notre Dame have its voice projected in the, in the strongest possible way into, into the public square. And I think we've, we've been doing this on a sort of individual basis. But I think there's a way to solve uh, the kind of collective action problem of excellent people around the university who occasionally find their way 
onto C-SPAN or CNN or MSNBC or into, or, or into you know, doing congressional testimony and the like. We want to have a coordinated effort whereby our scholars, our affiliated faculty, both inside the university and out, can be, can be put in touch with uh, folks at these media outlets, working with the communications office here at Notre Dame, but also working with our contacts in government our friends who are on the staff of different congressional committees. So when they need expert, expert witnesses to testify in a congressional hearing, they call us, or we can call them and say, how would you like a Notre Dame representative to come and talk about the HHS mandate, for example? How would you like a Notre Dame uh, expert to come and talk about some pressing issue uh, involving poverty? We can, uh, we can provide those services, and in that way, harness the great resources that we have here at Notre Dame and project our voice, that is Notre Dame's voice, into the public square in a way that not only influences people out there, but also reflects back, po reflects back positively on the university itself. Again, other projects that we have in mind that we're building out, we're, we, wanna, we want to increase our fellowship program. We want to start a junior fellows program whereby current Notre Dame students can participate in the life of the center, working with our, with our, our fellows and with our faculty and staff. We want to increase our number of postdoctoral fellowships to try to bring people into the university from outside who recently gotten PhDs at elite institutions, and we want to increase our visiting fellowships as well. And just a, a word about this, I mean, most university centers have fellowships. Most university centers pursue fellowships for the sake of raising the academic profile and the intellectual activity and to stimulate the intellectual activity at the university themselves. I think that's a great aspiration, and that's certainly what we're doing with these fellowships. But there's an additional element to our fellowships that also serves our purpose of, again, enlivening and, and deepening the Catholic character of this, of this university. And that is what we want to do with these fellowships is not simply have fellowships for the sake of themselves, but to have the fellowships become conduits through which the university can identify excellent people who are passionate about what is most distinctive about this university, which is to say its Catholic character, who can come in and perhaps find a permanent home at this university. That is, the university has a commitment to hiring elite Catholic scholars and other scholars from other faith traditions who are passionate about being part of an authentically Catholic institution like Notre Dame. And we can be helpful to those folks. We can be helpful to Father Bob Sullivan, for example, who, 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 is, who runs this effort, and the provost, and the president, all of whom who have expressed their strong commitment to Catholic hiring. We can play a very significant role here by using our context across elite academia to identify individuals who, who might fly under the radar who would be interesting uh, to Notre Dame. And, to, and so when they get here, not only do they participate in the work of the center, but we integrate them into the respective departments so they might ultimately find uh, a, a permanent home. And so we feel very excited to work in collaboration with the university on the project of hiring more individuals, better individuals, who are excited about the university and what's most distinctive about it. And it is the case, I think it's descriptively demonstrable, that the Catholic identity of this university is one mechanism by which we attract the very finest scholars uh, in the country. And, you, and for those of you who have been to these alumni presentations in the past, you've seen them firsthand. Brad Gregory from Stanford University came here because of the Catholic character. Patrick Griffin, the chair of our history department, came from University of Virginia, a, a, fa a fantastic department, because he was excited about Notre Dame and what was distinctive about it. So these fellowships are not simply meant to be conventional fellowships in the usual sense but also to be a conduit whereby the university can attract even better and more scholars. And some of, and our fellows thus far have, uh, are, are extraordinary. Ryan Madison uh, came to us from uh, the College of Thomas More, uh, and before that from Kenrick Glennon Seminary, where a cardinal had selected him to revivify their philosophy department. Peg Brinig, my colleague in the law school, is our Remick fellow. She is uh, one of the most prominent voices in family law. Uh, she's also an economist uh, in the country. John Finnis, I've already mentioned one of the most uh, exciting and one of the most important figures in legal philosophy in the 20th century. Father Bill Daly, who is our Thomas More Fellow, uh, expert in professional uh, ethics and, uh, and uh, also a, 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 an interesting fixture in, 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 in the media. He's frequently called upon by MSNBC to give comment on issues that are important to the church and important to Notre Dame. And John Haldane, one of the most important uh, Catholic intellectuals in the world from the University of St. Andrews, has agreed to be our 2013-2014 uh, Remick uh, Fellow. And you may have recognized him from this photograph in which he uh, is meeting with Pope Benedict. He's, one of, he's a key uh, papal uh, advisor in addition to being uh, an, a preeminent uh, philosopher and uh, public policy thinker uh, in, from the UK. So. 
That, those are the various ways in which we aspire to be a, a, a locus of intellectual fermentation and development, both for our students, our faculty, and our staff, and, uh, and to, try to promote the Catholic character of this university internally, but also to project, project the, the influence uh, of Notre Dame into the public square in a positive way uh, in the name of human dignity uh, and the common good. So thank you very much for your attention, and I'd be happy to take any questions or, or, or have discussion. Yes, sir. I think um, I, I got here in 2005, and I have to say, at this moment in the in the history of the university, I feel very optimistic about the integration of the Catholic character with the intellectual character, with the with our aspiration to be an elite research university. I think it's clear to everyone that those are highly integrated goals, uh, and it seems to me that the way we succeed as a research university is to take seriously and to promote our Catholic identity. And I know that Father Jenkins is committed to that, and I know that our leadership is committed to that. Well, I think, I mean, I, I, I mean, my speculation is that um, I think the Obama uh, commencement um, discussion, uh, I mean, if you will recall, w w as it unfolded, those critical of the university said, you know, you've, 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 you've betrayed your, your Catholic character by honoring this person. And one of the responses of the defenders of the university was, well, we're Notre Dame. We are a, we're an authentically Catholic university. I mean, and one that takes seriously our, our, our Catholic character and promotes it in, in all that we do. And I think that after the, after the, and after the dispute was over, those of, those of us here at the university, who, and, and there are many of us, including our leadership, who care about us as being a premier Catholic university, said, we need to take stock of what we've done to try to, to, try to model and witness to our deepest commitments. And so opportunities have arisen since then that the university has been very supportive of to do just that. That is to say, to, to increase uh, the, the public dimension of our commitment to the Catholic character of the university. So regardless of, of, you know, of, the, of the 2009 dispute over the Obama commencement uh, honorary degree, uh, I think it's, it seems clear to me that the university has, has, has pursued a path that is, uh, underscores what's always been true about Notre Dame, which is to say that it's a genuinely Catholic, authentically Catholic, proudly Catholic research university of the highest caliber. All right. Well, you guys, thank you so much for coming, and I hope you enjoy your, your stay here at Notre Dame.